Um, so Dr. Brown currently works at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She's written several books. Um, the first one was The Biography of No Place. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that already. Um, Plutopia, my favorite, because as we went through the graduate, and we have a graduate TA office in our department, and you know, we were organizing this conference, and we're like, well, talking about who the, who the keynote speaker is, and they're like, we got Kate Brown, they're like, like, who's that? And then, and then if somebody would come across her and be like, oh, you know, Plutopia lady. So I look at the archivist, or 
gives. And, and they're like, oh, and that's what you have to remember about archivists is they don't read. They just pull files. And so if nobody's checked out those files, they don't exist. And so I checked out the files and I started reading. And I haven't really been able to stop reading these files since. They're, they're really fascinating. And um, the records come in from everywhere. They come in from every um, you know, small county where people were living in, in conditions of high levels of, of radioactive contamination. And they tell pretty much the same story that um, there's a public health disaster going on. It starts in the summer of 1986. <coughs> the accident, by the way, was April 26, 1986. And it keeps going. Thank you. Um, so that by uh, 1988, um, you have this, these charts um, that come in, as I say, from, from, from all over the place, from places where they're treating uh, people who are cleanup workers, people who are evacuated from the zone, and people who are still living in these contaminated areas. And for instance, this um, one here, I don't know if I have a little red. Right here, this is the number of children they looked at. 1,551 children. And they're listing all the different you know, diseases. Um, there's usually about five categories. Uh, system disorders, res respiratory system disorders, circulation systems, digestive tract, and um, uh, this is endocrine. Um, so they, you know, they list them all. And so of these 1,500 kids, 1,132 have one chronic disease or another. And this is what you see over and over again. About 80% of the people in these areas are not healthy, have some chronic, usually multiple chronic health problems. And if you look at the the records from before 1986, that number is flipped. It's 20% have something among children, about 35% among adults, um, and the rest are healthy. And that number flips precipitously after 1988 for the most part. Um, the official count of people hospitalized after the disaster is 300. My count is 40,000. 40,000. And I haven't counted them. I'm just kind of in, in, in the obvious hospitals when you go down. Um, so, um, this information was censored until 1989 by the Soviet government. Um, but then Pedestroika occurred, and that was the sort of an opening up of the Soviet government and the idea that we should have more transparency in our media. And doctors came forth and started talking about these health problems to journalists and political groups formed to talk about these problems and sort of demanding change. And the officials in Moscow panicked. And um, we called in um, some help. And this is just some photographs that a, a local journalist gave me. Um, they used to just park in these contaminated areas, ambulances outside of the schools, because every day they get a call from you know, a kid who's passed out or a kid who has a uh, health problem. So in 1989, Moscow's panicking because all these people are up in arms about the Chernobyl health issues. And so they call in the, you know, the cowboys to help out. They call the World Health Organization. Um, and the World Health Organization says, yeah, of course we'd like to help. We'll do an independent assessment by foreign experts. And you know, that has a magical cachet at that time. And actually foreign experts will tell us the truth. Um, and the scientists came in, the three of them, uh, the physicists from France and, and the United States and Germany. And they spent uh, seven days in the Soviet Union, and they visited about five cities, and then they, they came away and they said, you know, everything's fine. Uh, the, the doses that people are getting are safe. You can even double the dose, no problem. Now, nobody believed this World Health uh, Organization assessment because how can scientists make, do something in five days? And, you know, what are they doing? But, but what they're actually up to is that they, because of you know, the Hiroshima studies, the, um, scientists in the West had this very um, specific way of doing radiation medicine. They took the doses that the estimated people had gotten in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and they um, said, you know, we got this many doses, and we saw this much of a rise of a handful of cancers, and they came up with these charts. You know, if you get so many um, deceivers, you get a certain small percentage of getting an extra cancer in your lifetime. And so the scientists didn't need to do any sort of study of bodies. They didn't need to do this. 
All they needed to do was look at how much radiation was out there. They run it by the charts. You know, here's you use the radiation map, you get to the chart, you run a computational study, you can do it from anywhere. You can do it from your desk in California. And then you just say, you know, there's no problem. Our science is good, we know our science is good, we're fine. Um, and so, after the World Health Organization did this study, uh, nobody knew them, that they called on, Moscow called on the International Atomic Energy Agency, another UN agency, and they came in, and they, they did it in a more convincing job. They, they spent 18 months on this study, they sent in 200 scientists who sort of zipped through in these two-week trips, and then they said the exact same thing that the World Health Organization said. They said, we see no sign of any kind of health damage, and we don't think there will be any detectable damage in the future. Case closed. Um, so you know, I'm working through this story, and I'm trying to figure out, well, who's right? You know, are these, are these Soviet doctors on the ground, are they right? Are these big international scientists? Do they have the right story? Um, so I decided I'd get my own education. Um, you know, as I worked through the archives, this typical map made no sense to me, in, in fact, because I would find hot spots of radiation you see over here. You know, there's the plan. A lot of it went up into Belarus and a little bit into Ukraine. Um, and then these sort of brown areas are sort of you know, lower levels of radiation, and then the rest are, are fine, right? But here's this town, Chernigo, for instance. I found um, some correspondence about a wool factory in, in Chernigo where the wool workers, mostly women, got doses, the same kind of high doses as liquidators. Those are the cleanup workers who were shoveling graphite off the roof right after the accident. You know? Like, how do wool workers get those kind of doses by working with wool. And so I, I went, I got in the car with my research assistant, Olya Martinu, and we went to the, turning it to the wool factory, and you know, the place hasn't been fixed up since 1937. Um, and we met the women, there was two hundred women on the list in, in 1990, and there were ten who remained. And um, the rest had, they said that we died or, or left as invalids. Um, and, and we talked, and, and you know, how did these women get the, get this, this kind of dose? Is they were just sorting wool, like these, this wool that you see down here. They were picking it up, you know, hugging it, carrying it over there, and then pulling it apart, sorting it like ball. Hugging one of those bales of, of wool at 3.2 millisieverts an hour, it's like, you know, embracing an x-ray machine while it's turned on. It was sort of terrifically hot. Um, and these women were pretty interesting. We had already talked to the managers, and they were kind of foggy. They were like, you know, we had a problem. We had a couple of workers who were throwing up, but we called up officials from Moscow. We changed our process, and everything was fine. You know, no story. But these women had, had really um, detailed knowledge. They, they said, you know, the wastewater from the plant, after we cleaned this radioactive wool, the wastewater went down to that little pond over there, and then it would cycle back into the municipal. And I knew they were right, because I read that in the records. They knew where the radiation had gone in their bodies. They had a pretty good idea of radiation medicine. And they talked about the thyroids, the, their joints, the plutonium and strontium and cells in the bone marrow. These women did not have a high school education, but they had a very good knowledge of the environment in which they were. They knew who had died, and they knew pretty much the doses of these people had died, who had died. Um, so I moved on, um, and I uh, thought, you know, I need to know more about radiation and ecology. And so I went right into the zone, you know, right here in the middle, um, and I hooked up with these two biologists. And I, the last three years, I've been sort of the participant observer. These guys are the only biologists I can find who are working actively working in the zone to look to see what this kind of radiation damage does to the environment. Um, other biologists you might read about, they don't actually go to the zone. They're physicists who sit at their office and run computational studies based on models. But these guys actually go, and they, and they run all kinds of experiments. The, the, the Chernobyl zone is kind of an interesting place. This is the part that's closed off, you need permission to enter. Uh, it's an interesting place because the radiation levels are very modeled. It's, it's almost like a, a, a quilt. 
and they differ on four orders of magnitude. So some places are quite clean, and some places are very hot. So it makes for a good sort of experimental zone. Um, and these two scientists have worked there since, the, uh, since 2000, and they found um, that the numbers of birds in the hot areas are depressed by 66%. And the reason they found for this is that the birds have um, either mutations or um, they don't have enough food to eat in the zone. They don't have enough food to eat because there aren't enough um, insects for them to eat. Um, they found that the numbers of spiders and butterflies and fruit flies had, was radically decreased. Um, and without these pollinators, they found that um, the fruit trees weren't getting pollinated, and so they bore a little fruit. And so when fruit trees went there and there fruit, there were many birds to eat fruit who then fly away and deposit seeds in other parts of the forest. So they found that since 1986, all of three apple trees had rooted in the zone um, in 30 years. So what they were finding is this cascade of extinction. Once one thing goes, like butterflies and bees, all these other things can follow. Um, Every rock we turn over, and so said, we find damage. It's quite obvious when we're there on the ground. And um, a couple months ago, in June, I was last there with them, and, and, and they said, well, we're going to go to the Red Forest today. And the Red Forest is the, the part that uh, the whole Chernobyl tragedy got to hit the hardest by radiation. It's the hottest spot. They call it the Red Forest because a day or two after the accident, so much radiation went over the forest. Oops. You can fix that one, okay. So much went over the, uh, that the forest turned, uh, the, the trees died, they turned red, and they died. And, um, and this whole area is now in the red forest. And so we went there, and I had learned as I traveled around these, because these guys that uh, pine trees are sort of the most vulnerable to um, radioactive uh, decay, and they mutate quite easily with radiation. And, and you can see, you know, this tree, um, was it was planted on purpose as part of a you know lumber forest, a timber forest, and they, they, they plant these pines so they go straight up, board straight, so you can just without many branches, they can just come down and use for housing and stuff. Uh, but as you can see, this this tree looks kind of strange, and these are the kind of mutations we see uh, throughout the forest, but especially in, in red forest. And the other thing that pine trees do is that they they get confused. The, the needles and the branches get confused. And so instead of growing straight up, they grow um, in, in a disorderly fashion, as the biologists call it. And they, they grow out like they look more like bushes. So that's that should be a tall pine tree by its age, but it's not, it's a bush. Um, so this summer when we went, and I wasn't I already wasn't happy about being in the red forest because of, you know the radiation there is, is pretty hot, it's uncomfortably hot. But there had been a forest fire there about nine months before we got there. And what the fire did was release all the radionuclides that had been stored safely, relatively safely, in the trees. The trees pick up these radionuclides from the soil and store them in the wood. And as long as nothing happens with that wood, it's okay. It's sort of inert. But once the fire hit, all, this, all these radionuclides that had been stored now are released again into the environment from the ash and uh, air. So as we went along, my Geiger counter just started going crazy, screaming in a way I've never heard before. And instead of it being like 50 to uh, 100 micro uh, seabirds an hour, it was suddenly 99, 999, almost a million seabirds an hour. That's, so that means with it, we spent about two or three hours in that forest, we got three years maximum dose for nuclear workers in that afternoon. So you know, when you think about nuclear workers and you think about these you know, working at a nuclear power plant is sissy stuff compared to the work that I just did. Um, and I think the fire, you know, you see a lot of uh, press, and, and, and you're going to see more quite soon because I know there's another TV show being made where National Geographic or a nature show will say, you know, look, the, the, the Chernobyl zone is this thriving zone, and, and it's this thriving nature preserve, and the message is, is that humans 
are worse for nature than radiation. And you just leave the zone alone, this area alone, and, and the birds come back, and the animals come back, and the trees come back. Um, and that's a, a nice story. It's a story we want to believe because we can then you know, mess things up, and then nature just fixes it for us so we don't have to think about it. Um, it it's not a true story, but it's also, um, I think this fire shows you how that if you just leave this area alone to regenerate itself, how wrong things can go. Like clearly that forest should have sprinklers on it and big sort of fire pits around it so that the fire doesn't hit a super radioactive forest. It's bad for all of it. Those, those uh, waves of smoke went all over your class that was sort of bidding you were there, you were breathing it in. Um, so I, what we need is actually to curate nature. And, and humans have long cured nature. There is no divide. There is no cure of nature zone on Earth. Um, so I kept moving on from, uh, from here, and I, and I went way over here to this area that doesn't look very, again, like Trinidad, you know, it doesn't look very radioactive. Um, but I um, met this guy in this town uh, near here, down, just down south who had been a, a sanitation doctor, um, a sanitation inspector in 1986. And, and he'd been, his job was to measure the milk and, and, and all the food. And, and he kept coming up with milk that was radioactive, above permissible levels of radioactivity. And he would write to Kim and say, the milk out here is, is radioactive. And, and Kim would write back and say, well, you're crazy because you're in an area where look, there's no radiation going on. There's practically none. You should have, you're making that up. So for three years, he kept trying to make this case that the milk was radioactive, and for three years, he kept trying to make it was crazy. So finally, he took seven tons of milk, and he put it in a truck, and he sent it to Kia, and he said, you measure it. And then they said, oh, yeah, it's radioactive. 100% of the milk is radioactive. Uh, so then what do we do, right? And, and, and in these areas up here, he said, we're the most radioactive milk was coming from. And so, up there is this big swamp. Europe's largest swamp is called the Dugget Marshes. And uh, it's a very watery landscape, as you can see. And um, so we went up there, and I started taking a look around. And I, and I, I asked the forester to sort of give me a tour to take us into the swamp. And we went into the swamp. And, and lo and behold, in the middle of the swamp, there's an old Soviet Air Force bombing range. Who would think, right? And it was on that sort of a very helicopter thing. And, and there was this big tower, and I climbed to the top of the tower. The forest was like, I'm not going up that rusty thing. So I went by myself, and there's the swamp, and then you go, there's some old villages. When they made the, the bombing range, they kicked out 10, ten villages to the sent people packing in 1961. And so there's an old village, and there's an old cemetery in the village, and then in the cemetery, in this old village, in this former bombing range, I see this crater, and from the crater is this tree, right here, funny tree, but it has the same kind of mutations that the trees have in a Chernobyl zone proper. And I asked the first person, how old do you think that tree is? You know, and the accident happened 30 years ago. I goes, I think that tree is about 50 years old. I said, huh, isn't that funny? I said, do you see a lot of, a lot of trees with these kind of mutations? And, of course, we look pretty disturbed. No. And none of the trees around there had these mutations, just the trees growing out of that one bomb crater. So what's going on? You know, I filed this away, you know, this piece of knowledge and these photographs, with um, interviews I'd had with villagers who said, you know, that bombing range out there, they were testing nuclear stuff. They were testing those little nuclear weapons that they used to throw in fields. You know, I, I don't like to take people's word for it. I'd like to get you know, some kind of archival verification. And I tried to, you know, to find out in Moscow in the Red Army um, files if that was true, if they were testing any kind of uh, weapons with you know, uranium uh, warheads like the Americans used in Iraq, um, or if they were testing little battlefield nukes. But those archives are closed um, for obvious reasons. And so, so what do we do? That you know, that's the nature of power. People who have archives decide they're not going to get in it. And, and what do you do? You just say, okay, I'm not going to find out that story. 
But I think that what we can do is maybe use the environment itself as an archive, as an archaeological site, and start to you know, wonder, maybe there's something else. And so I, started, I kept snooping around, I'm sort of obsessed with this spot in and then lo and behold, just like three days ago, if you could help me out with this, I would be really grateful. I come across this on Google Earth. What the heck is that? That is my lot. Sure looks like something went off there. And if you look at like uh, there's they used to the Soviets um, buried a lot of nuclear weapons and had these peaceful nuclear explosions to make um, reservoirs and lakes. Um, and they did bury bombs and, and blew them up to test them. And if you so about in uh, Kazakhstan, that was their sort of Nevada test site, not a desert. You see a lot of eyeballs, oculi that look like this. Um, so I don't know. Um, but what I do know, as, as I did more research, is that in 1961, this team of Soviet scientists showed up at that swamp, the Three Dead Marshes, and they did a study that lasted for five years. And the guy who ran the study was by the name of Alexander Murray. And if, if this guy showed up in your neighborhood, it was like having a grim reaper knocking on that door. He was, he, whenever there was a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union, this Murray guy was there. And so he shows up at the Pickett Marshes in 1964, a couple of years after they opened that Air Force bombing range. And um, he and his team of biologists went all around and they tested the milk and the soils and the trees and they found them all to be, have high levels of radiation in the surrounding areas in say Minsk and Kia nearby. Um, and they thought, you know, it's from global fallout, they say in their sense of publication. And they said, you know, these soils were particularly bad for recirculating. You know, the swampy soils of water and they recirculate radioactive waste widely. And they're also very poor in minerals, so the plants in them are very efficient. And so they take uh, calcium and iodine and potassium. And if, they're, if they have their radiological mimics, they quickly soak them up into the, from the soils into the plants and from the plants into the the berries, the mushrooms, the grass, all are um, extra radioactive when you're in a swamp, and in this Yupit swamp. Um, so Marais next took the people who lived in the swamp, and he ran them through whole body counters in 1965. And he found that the people had 10 to 30 times more radiation in their bodies, keeping them, than people in the skin here. Um, he asked the people what they ate, and it turns out they ate all four swamps including two liters of milk a day. So the diet was um, conducive to you know, uh, speeding radioactive products into your body. So he recommended that you know, there should be no kind of nuclear activity going on in the swamp, because the swamp was such a perfect uh, ecological transit zone to take radiation and bring it right into the food sources. But the year after he published his study, he started building the trail. Doing exactly what he said we should do in this swamp is put a big Europe's largest at the time nuclear power plant in the middle of it. So what was going on? Did they did, did, they, did they already decide to build a plant there and then study came in too late? That could be an option. Or did they decide this was a sacrifice zone? It was already radioactive from some series of incidences. And and all of us already messed up, we might have put the, 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 the nuclear plant there. So, I haven't yet figured out the answer to that question, but you know, staring at that crooked pine tree in that bomb crater, um, I realized that the, the perforations of radioactive isotopes into the organisms of the swamp long predated the Chernobyl explosions. And, and then I, I realized that the, the Chernobyl event might better be considered, rather than a one-off accident, an acceleration. Um, because if it's an accident, you just call Chernobyl an accident, then it begins and then it ends. And um, you can, as many people want to, you can stop counting the fatalities. 
and you can pronounce the Chernobyl zone to be a thriving natural nature preserve. But if we situate Chernobyl as a point of acceleration on a timeline of destruction, then we can begin to visualize a much larger stage of events. I think, you know, forcing ourselves to look at that ugly little pine tree in the bomb crater helps to see how the Chernobyl accident sits, you know, on a timeline that is in the middle of the Anthropocene. And, and just last year, geologists finally confirmed that we are in this new scene, this new epoch called the Anthropocene, in which humans are now the, 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 the greatest planetary force. And that a thousand years from now, if there are geologists still on Earth, they pour down, they take a section of Earth and, and pour down. They're going to find all these new elements that occur, like around 1945, 1951, that have never been in the Earth's you know, sedimentary level layer before. Things like radioactive isotopes and, and plastics, for instance. And, and they're going to be able to name this new scene quite clearly. We're also going to look at a lot, you know, a lot of chicken bones. Um, some of them are going to be so with the onset of the nuclear age in 1945, the incorporation of radiation into our daily lives, into our human bodies, became the new normal. I, I'm here to tell you, all of us have radiation in our bodies. Um, so Chernobyl serves in this longer history not as a, a singular event, but, but as an exclamation point in a whole chain of mishaps. Um, and so, you know, one major reason I, I wanted to write this book is to think of ways, other than denial, other than sort of refusing to look, that we can think about how to survive nuclear catastrophe and maybe even heal from it. Um, you know, how do we both commemorate the zone and care for it and people who still live there at the same time? And, um, you know, the Soviet solutions were very technical and, and scientific. They, um, right after the accident, they, they, they created these chemicals and they washed everything down with this green foam. And they, brought, they built dams to stop the flow of contaminated water. And they brought in bulldozers and removed the top soil of you know, earth that was contaminated and they buried it in graves. And if you know anything about soils, the top soils where all the important minerals and microbes are. So that, so what they were doing was sort of trying to get rid of nature and remove it and start all over. Um, but that didn't really work. They, they announced in 1989 that they had in, in their secret documents um, that they had managed that they were losing this battle. That the radiation kept coming back and the radiation levels were still as high as ever. Um, and that meant that locals could not safely farm. And so UN agencies came in the 90s and tried to figure out how locals could farm safely or find other economic activities to do. But those programs failed too. And so these people were still sitting up there, uh, you know, by that swamp. And I was really surprised um, in the summer of 2016. I went and I, you know, drive along and I expected to find these in other places. There were sort of the villages were sort of half empty and there's just old people and they're very depressed economically. But these villages were thriving. And they're thriving in part because there's all these people picking berries, thousands of people going into this huge swamp and picking blueberries. And then they, when they pick them, they get these baskets and they sell them to a, a middle man um, who sits on the road with a scale of eyes. Everybody can make about $25 a day with the basket of berries, and that's really good money up there. And so that's the, the, the woman in the middle there, it's oil, it's my, my colleague. We went and we got one of those baskets and, and we did a little of our own undercover blueberry picking. And uh, there I am, I'm happy so I just sold my berries. And, uh, and then we follow the middle, this middle woman to the warehouse where she sells her berries. And, and there they were, they were, they were wanding, you know, checking the radiation level of all these berries. And I asked this woman who was doing the wanding, like, how many of your berries are radioactive? And she said, all our berries are radioactive. She said, but some are really radioactive, like 3,000. I said, 3,000 what? She said, just 3,000. But she thought it was 3,000 back there was a kilogram. That's hot, right? And so, I so we stood around, we watched, and, and she bought all the berries, both the, the, you know, the dirty berries were over there, the clean berries, cleaner berries were over there. But then she bought them all. 
I said, well, what do you, what do, you do with those berries? And she's like, well, you, know, you just need an average. So you yeah. just mix them together, and you get to the European average, which is 600 becquerels a kilogram. And then all those berries are going into the EU market through Poland. And then they arrive on European breakfast cereals, and from the yogurts, and fresh berries, and fresh berries, etc. Now, there's been no discussion about this in, in Europe. Um, Ukraine has now um, surpassed Canada as the biggest exporter of berries to Europe and mushrooms. After they pick the blueberries, they go for cranberries, and they go for mushrooms. All the radioactive. Um, now, I, I guess that's one solution for the Chernobyl zone. It's good for the people locally. It's, you know, they, they laugh, they're like, you know, we sell you our wild organic berries and we get back berry flavored soda in return. And maybe that's a good exchange. The, the, the less these kids, especially, like this one, you notice how blue her lips are? This kid shouldn't even be in the forest by regulation, let alone eating those berries, right? Um, the rate of uh, University of Alabama for a Birmingham um, professor has done one of the few studies of the health problems temporary in the zone, he's found a six times higher rate of birth defects in this area where these people are living. Um, six times higher than the European norm. So um, I, I'm not sure that taking these berries and, and shipping them elsewhere, but it, it's better for these people biologically, but it's not good for the European norm. So how do you think of another way to do it? Um, Rather than, and you know, I, I guess I'm thinking about, and I want to leave you with a hopeful conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have my own bio, bioengineering solution, which is um, you think of these efficient mushrooms and berries um, that soak up radiation from the soil. Really, they do a great job doing that. Um, and so rather than have the locals pick the berries and sell them uh, for export to EU markets, you know, thus spreading Chernobyl radiation, why, do, why not buy up those berries and bury them? Same thing with the mushrooms. And, you know, how about a program to grow cabbages, also a really efficient product, and, and take those cabbages and bury them? And, um, and sort of have like a, a human plant conspiracy where together reuse, instead of trying to get rid of nature to clean up the dirt, to reuse nature to work with us to clean up this dirt. And, um, and then I can imagine that those end of the world tourists who love to go to the zone, they could maybe stop there, right? Pick berries in an radioactive swamp. That would be good selfie shots. And then they could pay, you know, to pick berries and then pay to dispose of them. Keep the tourist industry going. Right? Um, so, I guess I'm trying to think of ways to take um, part of the heritage we have as inheritors of an earth that's saturated with toxins, um, and to somehow find ways that we can joyfully participate in restoration and healing.